They're waiting for you, Gordon. In the test chamber. Half-Life is a definitive first-person shooter that rubs shoulders with the greats like Doom and Quake. It's heralded as a shining beacon of the genre, with a seamless narrative and compelling world. But some might say its luster has tarnished with age. So, what did Half-Life do that no game had done before? What helped to define its lasting appeal? And why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? PC gaming in the mid-90s was awash with a wave of first-person shooters. Ever since the release of Doom at the end of 1993, there were scores of derivative attempts to replicate its success. For every memorable Doom clone, there are ten more forgettable ones. And while shooting pixelated enemies in a texture map maze is fun, without innovation, the genre was at risk of getting stale. By late 1996, 3D accelerator cards were starting to gain traction within the PC gaming market, with the introduction of 3DFX's Voodoo series of cards. Offloading scene rendering onto a dedicated GPU meant a huge jump in potential performance, far superior frame rates and resolution. It wouldn't be long before developers would take advantage. Valve Software were founded in 1996 by former Microsoft employees Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington. Their first project was to be a science fiction themed first person shooter, expanding on the horror themes in earlier FPS like Doom and Quake, with influence from other genres like Resident Evil and films such as Alien. Half-Life's working title was Quiver inspired by Stephen King's novella The Mist, which featured a military base called Arrowhead, and would influence the game's plot. Quiver may also be an oblique reference to Quake, as Half-Life made use of a heavily modified version of the 1996 game's engine, as well as some components from Quake 2's It Take 2 engine. First publicly shown in early 1997 at E3, Half-Life was planned to release later that year, but a priority of quality over expedience, Valve Time, led to the game's eventual release in late 1998. It starts on a day like any other. You are placed into the shoes of a seemingly ordinary man. 27 years old, MIT graduate, Gordon Freeman. He is a silent protagonist, a man of action, not of words. And with the game's first-person perspective and lack of cutscenes, you don't see much of his face either. The original character model was much more distinctive. Ivan the space biker with a full beard and an intense stare. But the Gordon Freeman we know today is more reserved. It's only on the game box, main menu and loading screens that the final bespectacled visage of our protagonist appears. Quiet, unassuming, and he's late for work. The game opens with a tram ride, a ten minute tour that serves to introduce the player to the world of Black Mesa. You're free to move around the carriage, but you're along for the ride. Meanwhile, an automated announcement system spools off safety announcements drenched with foreshadowing. It's an interesting way to introduce the game's world, and a distinctly different one to that seen in Doom or Quake. No longer are you placed into a maze-like level with a gun in search of an exit. Instead, your path spans the entire game. Half-Life is very linear, but it's all by design. On a rail, the story is already in motion. The events that follow are inevitable. It wouldn't be much of a game if everything went right. The Resonance Cascade event tears a rift across dimensions and ushers in an alien incursion. It marks the end of what should have been a routine scientific experiment and the beginning of a struggle to survive. And in a way, 
It was all your fault. Maybe this never would have happened if you weren't running late. Maybe you were just following standard insertion procedure. Maybe Gordon Freeman isn't the hero of this story. Half-Life is not afraid to explore ambiguous morality. And while it's possible to waltz through, safe in the knowledge that you're the good guy, the game does sprinkle some seeds of doubt along the way. From the act of kick-starting a trans-dimensional cataclysm, or inadvertently sending scientists plunging to their doom, or slaughtering soldiers by the dozen, there's not much Gordon won't do in his desperate struggle to escape. Black Mesa is no stranger to questionable ethics. Slowly, the scope of the experimentation that took place at the top-secret facility is revealed. Weapons research, captive alien specimens, and even nuclear missiles. A hazardous work environment, then. Luckily, you are supplied with the equipment you need to endure it. The hazardous environment, or HEV suit, is the game's way of explaining Gordon's immense capability for survival. An incredible feat of engineering, it's capable of absorbing kinetic impact, radiation, biohazardous material, and yet limber enough to not hinder movement, nor to prevent passage through the smallest of spaces. Your suit is your Aegis, but what good is a shield without a sword? The game waits a while before granting you a weapon, but when you find your first offensive option, it is a particularly iconic one. A simple tool, forged by fire and flung into a position of importance. A symbol of defiance. The crowbar is the Half-Life series flagship weapon, and it proves its worth throughout the game. From smashing crates, clearing a path, or as a desperate defense against an oncoming enemy, when all other hopes of salvation have run dry. But then, fate always was on Gordon's side. The same can't be said for the aliens you encounter. There are a variety of trans-dimensional visitors, and the majority aren't friendly. The parasitic headcrabs take influence from aliens' facehugger, and turn their hosts into mindless zombies. The Vortigaunts are an enslaved race capable of shock tactics. The Grunts are half a ton of disgruntled alien. And there are bigger, even more noxious abominations that await in the darkest depths of Black Mesa. Aside from alien threats, there is a domestic force which stands in your way. The Hazardous Environment Combat Unit. Deployed to clean up and contain catastrophic events at any cost, their orders extend to silencing any civilian survivors. Naturally, this leads to some tension. One of Gordon's key weapons against these trained soldiers is the element of surprise. Often taking to the maze-like ventilation ducts to evade and outmaneuver insurmountable odds. From confined space to cavernous complex, the walls of Black Mesa contain many secrets. But there's always a certain familiarity to be found in the human construction. Zen was different. The last portion of Half-Life is a divisive one. You are flung into a strange alien world as part of a desperate attempt to undo what was set in motion at the very start of the game. A truly alien landscape, with floating islands made of some unknown chitin, and a shift in focus to teleporter puzzles and long jump platforming. Paired with a jump in difficulty, the last few chapters are the most grueling, and are generally considered the weakest part of the game. Zen is indeed a strange and unfamiliar place, but by far the most alien thing you'll encounter is just a regular guy in a suit. It's easy to miss the G-Man's appearances, but once you notice him watching in the distance, he seems to turn up everywhere. His nature is a mystery, 
an agent of some unseen eldritch force. Perhaps just a passive observer, or a hint of a conflict grander than any human mind could ever comprehend. Half-Life was released to critical acclaim. Hailed as the best shooter since the original Doom, it marks a pivotal moment in FPS history, and a cherry atop the golden era of PC gaming. Gearbox Software were founded in 1999, and were contracted to work on porting Half-Life to other platforms, and to produce expansion packs. The PC's first expansion was Opposing Force, which cast you into the boots of Adrian Shepard, a member of the very force sent in to clean up Black Mesa and eliminate Gordon Freeman. Blue Shift was the second PC expansion, although it was originally intended to be part of an unreleased Dreamcast port, abandoned due to the platform's imminent demise. You play Barney Calhoun, one of the many blue-suited security guards, in a quest to escape Black Mesa. The PS2 version emerged in 2001, featuring cooperative play and an exclusive expansion in Half-Life Decay. In terms of multiplayer, it was Half-Life's mods that overshadowed its own deathmatch mode. Like Doom and Quake before it, modders flocked to the new FPS, in some cases porting over established mods to the Gold Source engine. Action Half-Life and Team Fortress Classic both have roots in Quake, with the latter's class-based team action eventually spawning a sequel. Day of Defeat blended objective-based multiplayer with the then-popular World War II setting, and the incredibly popular Counter-Strike, which, in all its forms, has stayed near the top of most played lists for more than a decade. While multiplayer mods gained the greatest share of the limelight, single-player mods like They Hunger showed what a few talented folk could do with the engine. Half-Life's longevity was greatly expanded by its modding scene, which is just as well, considering how long a sequel took to arrive. A worthy follow-up to a game like Half-Life is a tall order. A revolutionary game builds greater expectation than just more of the same. Thankfully, Valve liked to take their time with things. After six years, and some drama along the way, Half-Life 2 would eventually appear in late 2004, alongside its new Source engine. Set some years after the original, the event in Half-Life cast mankind into an interdimensional war it had no hopes of winning, and thus Gordon Freeman re-emerges as some kind of messiah. Certainly a departure from the original, and with perhaps too great a focus on the new engine's physics capabilities, Half-Life 2 is nonetheless a great game in its own right. With the rising tide of video game budgets, the argument for episodic content was becoming more compelling, although in hindsight it seems Valve are not well suited to releasing anything piecemeal. Half-Life 2 Episode 1 was released in 2006, and Episode 2 a year later, both offering a direct development of Half-Life 2's story, along with technical improvements to the Source engine. And as for the third episode, one day, perhaps. In the meantime, Valve seemed to be investing more effort in multiplayer titles, such as Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and Dota 2. And, of course, Valve are also responsible for the most popular digital distribution platform on the PC, Steam. The trade of in-game items must be more lucrative than the one-time purchase of a single-player title. But still, some yearn to don the HEV suit once more. Long-awaited mod and visual upgrade for Half-Life, Black Mesa finally came out in 2012, after eight years in development. Not quite the sequel we're looking for, but still, a good opportunity to revisit the original. Half-Life's impact post-release is unquantifiable. Countless games will have taken influence, whether directly or not. 
it dispensed with the level-by-level -level approach of earlier FPS games. Instead, offering an unbroken experience from start to finish. Its seamless universe and complete lack of cutscenes marked the death of old-school FPS. A bifurcation of the genre into pure action multiplayer titles and more cinematic single-player games. No longer were level walls just containment for arena-style action. Instead, the scenery itself helped sell the story. From its claustrophobic vents to its massive, noisy industrial plants, Black Mesa is equal parts believable and incredible. The experiential narrative was the perfect vehicle for horror. With scripted events that could respond to the player or force them to flee. Later scary games would certainly take note. The tense atmosphere in games like Doom 3, Fear, and Bioshock all have roots in the techniques first seen in Half-Life. It also opened the doors for other experience-led games. As you don Gordon's HEV suit in Half-Life, titles like Medal of Honor Allied Assault similarly thrust you into the boots of a soldier in a more believable and immersive way than ever before. Truly a turning point for cinematic video games. Its influence broad and memories fond. Half-Life is a classic. While today its graphics are dated and its innovations are taken for granted, it nevertheless marks a watershed in the way games could tell a story. From start to finish, it is a seamless and shining example of what every video game aspires to be. An experience. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell.